Today we're going to discuss uh, section 12.4 and 12.5. So we're going to talk a little bit more about polar covalent bonds, uh, ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and their electron configuration. Okay, when an ionic compound forms, we said that electrons were stolen. So a metal loses electrons to the nonmetal. Well, most elements want to have an electron configuration that's similar to a noble gas. Because noble gases don't react, they're already stable. And an element's goal in life is to be stable. So metals will lose electrons, become cations, get an electron configuration similar to a noble gas. Anions, or nonmetals, will gain electrons to help them have electron configuration similar to a noble gas. So let's go through some of the uh, common groups. So we have sodium, um, which loses an electron to become Na plus 1. Its atom electron configuration is neon 3s1. But if it loses that electron, this part goes away, and now its electron configuration is similar to the noble gas. This is for the ion sodium plus 1. Magnesium does the same thing, or anything in group 2, actually, because remember, all elements in group 2 will form plus 2 cations. So uh, it loses actually two electrons. So now the atom electron configuration is neon 3s2 because it loses two electrons. Now it becomes similar to neon. The atom doesn't become neon. Its noble gas, its electron configuration is just similar to the noble gas. It's not changing its identity. So for aluminum, it's going to lose three electrons. So its atom electron configuration is neon 3s2 3p1. But then when it loses those three electrons, now it's no, but its electron configuration is similar to the noble gas. Now anions are a little bit different. Group 6 and 7 form anions. So now they are gaining electrons. So oxygen gains two electrons to become O2 minus. Its atom electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. When it gains two more, this would become 2p8, which then gives it noble gas electron configuration. Fluorine, or any other group 7, gains one electron to become F minus one. So its atom electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p7. When it gains an electron, it becomes 2p8, giving it an electron configuration similar to a noble gas. So all elements' purpose is to try to become like a noble gas, because that will make them stable. So representative metals form ions by losing enough electrons to achieve the configuration of the previous noble gas. If we go back to sodium, magnesium, aluminum, neon is the previous noble gas. Nonmetals form ions by gaining enough electrons to achieve the configuration of the next noble gas. So for oxygen and fluorine, neon is the next noble gas if you kept going. In almost all stable compounds of the representative elements, which are basically all elements except the transition metals, all the atoms have achieved noble gas electron configuration. That's why they become the charges that they are, so they can have this noble gas electron configuration. So for example, in water, oxygen has six electrons, but it wants eight. So <clears throat> because water is a polar covalent bond, it's going to find a way to share two electrons. Well, sharing with two hydrogens works out because each hydrogen wants one, and so if they can all share those two, Oxygen gets 8, and hydrogen each gets 2. <clears throat> okay, so if we take a nonmetal and a group 1, 2, or 3 metal, we are creating an ionic bond. And so the valence electron configuration of the nonmetal is completed to achieve the configuration of the next noble gas, so electrons are added. And the valence electron configuration of the metal is emptied, electrons are removed to achieve the configuration of the previous noble gas. So this pairing works really well because these want electrons, metals don't, and so they'll, they work together. So if we look at NaCl, Na, Na is neon and then 3s1, chlorine, and this is the electron configuration for the element. Chlorine is neon 3s2, 3p5. Neon wants to get rid of an electron. Chlorine wants one more, and so it'll donate its electron to chlorine. If we take a nonmetal and a nonmetal, that forms either a covalent bond 
or a polar covalent bond, depending on if the nonmetals are the same or different. Electrons, in this case, get shared to complete the valence electron configuration for all the atoms involved in the bond. So whereas in the ionic compound they're stolen, in covalent and polar covalent the electrons are shared. So for O2, oxygen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Each oxygen wants two more electrons to get 2p6, and so those two electrons are shared between the oxygens. Okay, so let's talk about how to predict formulas of ionic compounds. So let's say we have a compound of calcium and oxygen. Calcium's electron configuration is argon or S2. Oxygen's is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Well, the electronegativity of oxygen is greater than calcium, so we know that this is a polar covalent bond. Oh, sorry, an ionic bond. It's an ionic bond because we're coming from opposite ends of the periodic table. And because oxygen's electronegativity is greater, electrons are going to be taken from calcium and given to oxygen. Oxygen needs two electrons in order to have a noble gas um, electron configuration. So calcium will donate these two electrons to oxygen, and now oxygen becomes O2 minus. Because calcium donated its two electrons, now it becomes Ca2 plus. And so when we put them together, we get CaO, because we have a plus 2, minus 2, and it's good as is. Let's look at another example. Let's say we have aluminum and oxygen. Aluminum is neon 3s2, 3p1. Well, we know an oxygen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Well, the electronegativity for oxygen is greater, and so electrons are going to be taken from aluminum and given to oxygen. Oxygen needs two electrons to have a noble gas electron configuration, so it becomes O2 minus, and aluminum loses its three electrons to get a noble gas electron configuration, so it becomes Al3 plus. So we put those together. We need more than one because we have plus three, minus two, and so we need two aluminums and three oxygens in order to create a neutral compound. Okay, let's look at structures of ionic compounds. Ionic bonds are very strong, and this is due to the attraction between the cation and the anion. Most ionic compounds are packed together with the cations placed between the anions. It's a very crystalline structure in most cases. And anions are going to be larger than what we call the parent atom because they gain electrons. So, for example, if chlorine is the parent atom, the anion would be Cl1 minus, so it gained electrons. It's going to be bigger in size. Cations are smaller than the parent atom because they lose electrons. So if we have sodium as our parent atom, Na plus 1 is our cation, and it's going to be smaller because it lost that electron. So here's some pictures of NaCl. Um, you can see that it has a lattice structure, so it's kind of like a crystal. And we've got an ordered arrangement of our cations and anions. Here's a more space-filling model. You can see that those silver ones are Na plus. They're smaller. And our red ones are Cl minus, and they're larger. And then if you looked at salt crystals with a microscope, they would look this very crystalline structure. Okay, we've also got lots of ionic compounds that contain polyatomics. These behave just like binary, which means two, just like binary ionic compounds. The bonds holding the polyatomic together are covalent bonds, but then the bond between the polyatomic and the, the other part, either the cation or the anion, are ionic. And that's why it's called an ionic compound. So for CaSO4, we have Ca2+, bonded to SO4, 2 minus, so this is our ionic bond. But then if we look at SO4, all these bonds are um, polar covalent bonds because these are two nonmetals, but they're not the same identity. Okay, so we're more interested in this ionic bond, but keep in mind, remember, we just want to treat this like any other anion. Okay, here's some practice, and we'll discuss this one class. Have a good day.